uh, published by the uh, it's a new book uh, uh, from the University of California Press. It just came out this uh, past uh, May. This afternoon, uh, we're going to have uh, Professor Kendall open our discussion by uh, uh, introducing her, uh, her new work and some of the uh, issues that uh, she uh, wants uh, us to be aware of. Uh, and then uh, by we, following this, we're going to have uh, two uh, discussions. So let me briefly introduce now uh, all, all three of uh, our members of our panel. Uh, Professor Kendall, the author, is the curator of Asian ethnographic collections at the American Museum of Natural History. She is also chair of the Anthropology Division at the American Museum, and she is a senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and an adjunct professor in the Columbia University Department of Anthropology. Also, she is a former president of the Association for Asian Studies. I have known Professor uh, uh, Kendall since she was a graduate student at Columbia in the anthropology department, and subsequent to which I've had the pleasure of teaching with her jointly courses on popular religion in uh, East Asia several times. So uh, I, am, I, I, I know her both as a student, as a, a teacher, and as a very eminent uh, scholar. Uh, the, uh, the next uh, uh, member of the panel I would like to introduce is Professor Max Mormon, and he is a professor in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Cultures. He is co-chair of the Columbia University Seminar in Buddhist Studies and an associate director of the Columbia Center for Buddhism and Asian uh, Religion. And uh, last but not least is Professor Leslie A. Sharp, and she is the Barbara Chamberlain and Helen Chamberlain uh, Josephberg Professor of Anthropology at Barnard College. She is in the program of the Columbia Anthropology Department. She is a senior research scientist in, the so in sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health, Columbia University. And uh, she is a fellow uh, of the Center for Animal and Public Policy of the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. So as you know, all of our participants uh, uh, are very active uh, 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 within the field. Now, um, uh, the way we're going to uh, organize this uh, presentation is that uh, I will first start with uh, Professor uh, Kendall, and she will uh, she will uh, introduce her uh, her own uh, uh, her, her own publication, and then we will uh, uh, turn to uh, Professors uh, Mormon and Sharp. So, uh, uh, Laurel, why don't you uh, why don't you just begin then? Okay, thank you, Myron. I want to thank the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and the New York Southeast Asian Network for hosting this event. I want to thank Professor Myron Cohn for agreeing to moderate. I want to thank Max Mormon and Leslie Sharp for agreeing to broaden the conversation. It was something of a surprise to me when a reviewer described mediums and magical things as an unusual interdisciplinary combination. Surprising because as an area specialist trained at Columbia as an anthropologist and as a Koreanist, I've always considered my work interdisciplinary, um, a combination nurtured initially by the then pre-Weatherhead East Asian Institute, always both multidisciplinary and border crossing. Um, when Professor Cohen was my advisor many years ago, in my first semester at Columbia, he taught a course with Professor Herb Passan on traditional Chinese and Japanese society that made all those challenges of interdisciplinarity and border crossing very exciting. What I consider unusual about mediums and magical things scary even, is that while there's a lot of Korea in the book, I did step out of my own comfort zone and included observations from work done in Vietnam, Myanmar, and Bali, places where I cannot claim to be a specialist and where the work is necessarily collaborative. In the book, I describe how the project began, and I will share that with you. Uh, Early in the, oops, if I can advance my slideshow. 
Uh, just oh, okay. I've got to do this. Okay. Um, hope I don't have to do that every time. Uh, early in the new millennium, I worked with Dr. Win Bun Hui, director of the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology, in co-curating the exhibition Vietnam: Journeys of Body, Mind, and Spirit. It was a thrilling and exhausting endeavor involving three intense years of close collaboration between Vietnamese and American colleagues. For labels and exhibition book essays, we evolved a conscientious practice of translating, editing, back translating, and more editing until the final joint sign off, all of which I experienced as an absorbing seminar in Vietnamese culture. This way of working would become a model for me as the projects that became this book took shape. Um, at the same time, following one of the threads in our exhibition story and my own anthropological interests, I was swept into the exuberant revivification of popular religion that was taking place in Vietnam at the turn of the millennium. The spirit medium, Madame Zun's visit, occurred in the middle of our work. Tian Hung Palace, primary seat of mother goddess worship in Northern Vietnam, had donated statues to the exhibit. Um, they had wanted to garner respect for their religion overseas. The statues arrived at the VME at an unfortunate moment in the history of our exhibition project. The financial crisis had hit New York City in the wake of 9-11, forcing us to drastically trim our objects list to a third of our original intention. Innocent of the Chen Hong Palace's emotional investment in having the statues exhibited in New York, indeed innocent of the high quality of the statues that had arrived at the museum, I suggested that the pinched exhibition budget could not accommodate shipping large, fragile, heavy objects, and that the statues were obvious candidates for omission. Director Win Ban Hui turned to the Tian Hung Palace for advice, wondering if some smaller statues in the VME collection could be sent instead. The temple keepers were profoundly disappointed that the Tian Hung statues would not be traveling to New York. Madame Zuen descended from the palace to assess the situation. Because the three mother goddess statues had grown dusty in storage, and in anticipation of Madame Zuen's visit, uh, the collections management team at VME took the gold covered images out of the storeroom and placed them on a low planked platform and began to clean them, everyone remarking on their fine quality. They were still at work when Madame Zuen arrived and reacted with horror. On the floor? You put them on the floor? Would you put Ho Chi Minh's image on the floor? Profound apologies ensued. My Vietnamese colleagues hoped to, um, my, uh, my Vietnamese colleagues understood that these three statues had not been ritually enlivened with the souls of deities. They saw them as fundamentally different from the statues become gods that lead active lives on temple altars, practices which they, unlike me, were already well acquainted. So they were not enlivened, but at the same time, these were not ordinary artifacts as Madame Zwing was causing us to see. What were they? Well, this incident, the MacGuffin, provoked a subsequent research projects into the lives of sacred objects in the VME collection. Um, the Wonder Grand Foundation gave us funds sufficient to, to sustain six linked research projects. Mine with two young researchers um, involved the mother goddess statues and others like them. And we began our work going back to the Tian Hung Palace. We learned about the making of temple statues as a complex process intended to produce the sort of container that would, through the work of a ritual master, invite and contain a god. 
We learned about the selection of proper woods on proper days, the workshop taboos intended to keep the statue clean, the offerings that punctuated the process, the ceremonious transfer of the statue to the temple, its placing on the altar, and its enlivening in the deep midnight hour. I came to see the production of a statue as a mingling of magic and craft, to see good craftsmanship as not only practical and aesthetic, the production of a durable and beautiful statue, but also to be magical in its intention, an exacting contribution to the making of a space that can house a god. I had been naive. I had not until this work realized how ontologically present a god or a Buddha was meant to be inside a temple statue. I wanted to see if what I was learning applied to the images I had encountered in Korean shaman shrines, images that were also seen as in some sense housing, housing souls and occasionally making trouble. I would, but I had also bumbled into a larger topic an intern introduced me to Richard Davis's important work on Indian images. I found Donald Swearer's and Angela Chu's studies of the consecration of Buddhist images in Thailand, Lin Weiping's work on statues and popular religion in Taiwan, many studies about image production and consecration in Japan, and the important Kamakura exhibit at the Asia Society in 2016 that exhibited the insides of 13th century images as matter of consequence. These were specialized works, India, Thailand, China, Japan, and my combination of Korean and Vietnamese experiences made me crave a larger dialogue about images in the Hindu Buddhist world. Images which across a vast swath of time and space were made to be enlivened with presence and in this sense, very different from the Catholic world where the blessed image is officially representational an inspiration to prayerfully address Christ or a saint as an entity beyond the statue and not inside it. And where occasional intimations of presence, statues that weep or bleed or, or fly are matters of theological squeamishness. The book is imagined not as a controlled comparison, but as a dialogue anchored in four core cases, Vietnam, Myanmar, Korea, and Bali. In other words, three of my four examples are from places where I am not a specialist, and the things I have to say come from rigorous teamwork and exacting acts of translation and back translation. This is not a perfect situation, not a comfortable situation for an anthropologist, but one that rather than dealing with inert texts in a library, enabled many conversations on the ground about how statues mean in the present tense and how people sometimes disagree about statue propriety. I describe this process in the book, and I will share that passage with you. Sometimes I have seen myself as a transnational medium of an imagined conversation, bringing what I heard in Vietnam or witnessed in Korea into an interview with a Balinese carver, listening while the Balinese carver talks back. I found sufficient common ground to fuel my conversations with artisans and practitioners in different settings, making possible a vicarious dialogue between them. In a workshop in Vietnam, I heard that a shaman in Korea told me the gods fought with each other and fell to the floor. This study is in the first instance, a realization of that wide ranging dialogue. But there were also obvious limitations to what I heard through the tissue of translation and saw through only limited observations. This was not, at the end of the day, real field work, although I do believe that whatever one might call it, it was worth the effort. I entertain the fantasy of a pre babel situation in which I might bring some of the artisans, a Korean painter, a Vietnamese and Burmese woodcarver, a Balinese mask maker, 
and treat them all to an evening of food and drink. I imagine the setting as a traditional wine house in the Insadong district of Seoul, a place where some of the interviews for this book actually took place. In my fantasy encounter, these artisans from different places are magically vested with a common language and converse directly with each other, sharing cups of wine and enjoying flashes of recognition. Are you supposed to be celibate when you carve? Yeah, we're supposed to be celibate too. And then at an opportune moment, I quietly slip out of the room to pay the bill, leaving the guys alone. The Korean painter leans across the table. This is in my fantasy, of course. The Korean painter leans across the table and fills the Vietnamese carver's wine cup, winking as he asks, are you really celibate? These are things I will not know. So, um, the value of this kind of work for me uh, was in the surprising conversations that upended budding generalizations that took the comparison out of control. Uh, the new insights I got when I took my dawning awareness of image enlivening back to Korea, for example, and asked my shaman teacher, Yongsu's mother, about the images that hang above her altar and then asked other shamans as well. The images in Yongsu's mother's shrine she had described to me once as having fought with each other and fallen to the floor. So I asked her a basic question. Um, when do the gods go into the pictures? Um, she brushed the query aside as nearly irrelevant, stating that during the initiation ritual, the initiate sees the presence of her gods, that their souls appear during the initiation. Still not satisfied, I asked again in another interview a few months later, when do the gods go into the pictures? When the initiate sees the faces of the gods in her initiation ritual, then they are present in her shrine. I asked if there was a special ceremony for this. Oh, nothing special, she said. The gods are already present. I molded over and I remembered a vivid a moment from an initiation ritual that Diana Lee and I had captured on our film in 1989. The young initiate with great reticence and palpable fear ascends a makeshift structure and balances carefully on large iron blades used to cut fodder, the climax of the ritual. The initiate bursts into tears, pounds the wall, turns to the mansion and the camera and shouts in tearful triumph, they're coming through, they're all here. The older mansion tells her that it would have been a real disaster if she had gone all the way up on the blades and the gods had not shown up. This was it, the simultaneous activation of shaman and shrine as linked entities through the agency of willing gods or so it seemed. The activation of a painting like the activation of a shaman is in no way guaranteed. Indeed, in the filmed instance recounted above, the inspiration was eventually judged to be insufficient. The initiate did not become a munchin, and in retrospect, the ritual was considered a failure. Most munchin initiations fail. There is no guarantee that the initiate will find the inspiration to call the gods in, no guarantee that she will see in what vision or waking dream the gods arrival, no guarantee that inspiration will pour out of her such that she will speak in the authoritative voice of God. By broad analogy, liturgical practices for enlivening a statue resemble a cookbook. Follow the procedure scrupulously, use good ingredients, and the result will be a souffle. Not easy, but largely predictable. Missteps cause misfortune, and some ritual masters, like some cooks, are simply more skilled than others at producing the best results. A munchin's ability to receive her gods, by contrast, is like making a souffle in the absence of a clear recipe and with the omnipresent possibility of high humidity troubling the egg whites or the fatal slam of an oven door collapsing the rising batter. 
So, um, so uh, I was learning things. I was learning things by asking in different places. And I thought Bali would be a nice place to round out the project. It's sometimes said that anthropologists aspire to go to Bali when they die. Um, Bali, um, there's a large literature already about masks and mask making. Some of it contrasting the power charge Tungut masks that are used in temple rituals with the similar looking, but not, not at all sacred masks made for tourists and sold all day, every day, all over the island, or at least they were in pre-COVID times. But on my very first night in Bali, I learned about a souvenir mask that had taken on a life of its own. Um, these eccentric images that act beyond the expectation of type are the, uh, the subject of the last passage I will share with you today. The private family temple of the former rulers of Ubud houses a remarkable and much remarked upon mask, uh, popularly known as Jiro America. The story is perennially told in human interest journalism and on social media, has been enacted in one spooky docudrama and was related by several conversation partners. The mask in question was gifted to an expat as a wedding present, a seemingly ordinary decorative mask. But when the owner carried it to North America, it rattled in the dead of night, made chewing noises when the family dined and terrorized the children. Some say it flew. The owner, returned the mask to Bali where it was received by the former ruling family of Ubud and after yet more uncanny mask behavior was recognized as being energized by a sesuhunan, a local tutelary god. On the head of a medium, Jiro America appears at local festivals, patrolling through and beyond Ubud to expose practitioners of black magic. Giro America, if spectacular, is far from unique. We heard many other tales of masks that, with no prior intention in their making, give some sensate indication of an animating presence charged with power and agency. And I will share one of those stories. It's close to Halloween. There are many, many more stories in the book itself. But here we go. The director of a performing arts troupe told us how she had purchased two inexpensive masks from the Badu market, ordinary things, which she carried in her backpack like commonplace purchase. Even so, one of her students fell into a deep trance when dancing with one of these masks. She danced and danced until members of the troupe managed to pull the mask from her face, leaving her weeping compulsively. Thereafter, the mask was ma marked, do not use, but another dancer put it on by mistake and the same thing happened. The mask now lives in a temple in the dancer's home village. Uh, when we asked carvers and other knowledgeable Balinese how a mask could become sacred by accident beyond the intentions of a carver and a temple community, most began their explanations with the wood. In one mask maker's words, the wood must have been taken from a really special place. The carver bought the wood from someone in a commercial lot. He didn't know, but the wood could have come from a charged and powerful pule tree with an enlivening spirit soul already present. Or the carver might have used wood left over from a sacred commission and therefore already the beneficiary of sacred protocols for making a Tungut mask. The carver of a mask for the Art Institute, a mask that was intended for secular performance, um, roamed around on offering days until it was enshrined. He spoke of the strangely forked wood he had used to, for this commission, wood from a pule tree that had been cut to widen a road and whose shape he still remembered vividly years after carving the mask. He wondered if potent material was the ultimate source of the mask's midnight wanderings. 
even if a, a woodcutter had paid no attention to the calendar since he was cutting a tree and not ritually extracting a bump, and even though there would have been no ceremony, the tree could have been cut on a lucky day just by chance. The carver might have begun his work in a good hour on a good day by happenstance. The carver and his tools might have been in a state of purity for another commission, and he might have worked in a properly meditative frame of mind, owing to personal temperament and work practice, intentionally producing a powerful mask. And finally, just finally, the Niskala forces, the invisible forces enlivening a mask might have exerted their own agency in choosing a vehicle. Many Balinese do speculate that the buzzing noises emanating from a particular mask could be from insects and that flying masks just might be moved by wind. And yet most of our interlocutors comfortably abducted agency not only to ritually and sold temple masks, but to some others that had given evidence of being in sold and tended outside the rules and procedures that normally obtain between Balinese and temple masks. While some of our interlocutors disputed the specific claims made for Jiro America, the Sesu Hunan identified with the town of Ubud, a Denpasar intellectual who wrote off the Jiro America story as urban folklore is the same person who related how seemingly ordinary masks that she had purchased from the market through members of her dance troupe into deep trance. So um, here we are. And in conclusion, I, um, I will end on this note of inconsistency of people who disagree with other people in the same space and people who have things to offer that shakes a story, shakes a certainty in another place. Uh, complex procedural possibilities, disputed stories. This is what the anthropologist brings to the table in a work that aspires to be a dialogue rather than a controlled comparison. That on the ground, things are not fixed, that invisible beings can sometimes behave in eccentric ways, and that our conversation partners may disagree with each other for their own reasons, which makes for a livelier conversation. And I'm looking to Leslie and Max for that lively conversation. I want to also express gratitude to those who worked with me in this project and to thank you all for being here. Great, thank you very much. So now let's turn to uh, Professor Mormon. Hello, uh, thank you, Laurel, for uh, inviting me into this conversation. Uh, it's a very rich one for me right now. I'm. Uh, I'm curating an exhibition of uh, Buddhist objects in Columbia collections and trying to figure out how to think about their life and their use uh, within a museum setting, which is something that um, something that you have been doing for many years. Uh, I enjoyed the book tremendously. Uh, Mediums and Magical Things uh, examines and situates the methods and materials by which religious icons are enlivened. It covers a geographically wide and religiously diverse range of cultures across Asia, North Vietnam, South Korea, Myanmar, and Bali, and also diachronically across the extended lifetime of icons from their formation and fabrication, their animation and consecration, their life and labor, their retirement and deconsecration, and onto their afterlives of disuse and museumification. In all of these cultural sites and in all of these stages and processes, the book reveals the social life and material conditions of, the fact, of their facture and use. And as a comparative project, it is thoughtful and purposeful. The four case studies have deep commonalities, which are particular and instructive. A commonalities which, and here I quote from Laurel's book, 
a broad comparative frame makes it possible to see more clearly. What they share are, to quote again, complex technologies associated with Sinocentric and Sanskritic cultural practices, rooted and intertwined with local practices and sometimes with each other, not at odds with Hinduism and Buddhism, but emerging from the very stuff of it. So for me, someone who's interested in the life of East Asian Buddhist objects and images, which are similarly rooted in combinations of Indic and Sinitic traditions, it is a comparative project at once provocative and productive. The four case studies, the mother goddess uh, worship of North Vietnam spirit mediums, the god pictures, of South Korean shamanism, the statues of knots in the uh, cults of Myanmar, and the dance masks of Balinese trance share another commonality. They are objects and traditions which have been largely ignored by historians of religion and by historians of art. And perhaps because of this, taken up by anthropologists because the anthropologist attends to the missing link between the religion and the artifact. That is the social actors who produce, consecrate and animate them, who possess them and are possessed by them. The shamans, the mediums, the ritual masters, the dancers who are like the images and objects they enable themselves temporarily Similarly, instruments, containers, and substitute bodies for the gods. I think that the, uh, that the example that uh, Laurel gave of uh, the question that she asked the Korean shaman, when do the gods enter the image, and found out it's only through the experience of the ritualist connects those two. Some people study gods, some people study images, some people study ritualists. All three are necessary for this conversation. So my first question for Laurel, um, and you can answer this at the end of my comments, which I promise you won't go on too much longer, is if the cultural practices and material objects so richly described in this book have been largely ignored by scholars of religion and scholars of art, what can historians of Asian religions and historians of Asian art learn from their collective oversights and also from the collective insights of anthropologists? Laurel and I learned that we cared, uh, shared a common interest in the technologies of animating icons uh, during a symposium at Columbia held in conjunction with the 2016 Asia Society exhibition she described on medieval Japanese Buddhist sculpture. Uh, she, uh, she mentions it, uh, describes it in a footnote that the exhibition revealed prayerful inscriptions on the statue's interior cavities and displayed some of the animating material that had been placed inside of them. Laurel actually refers to one such item in her book, the very famous living body of Shakyamuni at Seryoji, a 10th century wooden sculpture produced in China and venerated in Japan that when opened, in 1953, revealed a set of padded silk internal organs, as well as hundreds of other items inside the body of the Buddha. Now, although enshrined in a Japanese temple, this icon exemplifies and embodies the ontology of Buddhist images across Asia. It's known as the red sandalwood statue of Shakyamuni Buddha transmitted through the three countries of India, China, and Japan. It claims to be the originary and living image of the Buddha 
carved from life and produced in heaven. The story then of the very first of all Buddha images is told in the earliest Indian scriptures to be translated into Chinese. According to the story, after his enlightenment, the Buddha, like all good sons, went to visit his mother. But as the Buddha's mother had died soon after giving birth to him, he has to go visit her in heaven, in the Triatrimsa heaven, the heaven of the 33 gods. And while he's up there, the king of the country in which he had been staying is so distressed by the Buddha's absence that he declares that he would die if he did not see the Buddha. So he asks the Buddha's disciple, who's still down there on the ground, a disciple renowned for his supernormal powers, to magically transport the artisans, very much like in, uh, in Laurel's fantasy, to magically transport the artisans to heaven, to copy the Buddha's form and come back down where he has an exact replica of the Buddha carved out of sandalwood. Now, when the Buddha returns to the king's palace, he sees the statue, and the seated statue stands up to greet him. The Buddha acknowledges the statue and says to him, you will lead my followers after I'm gone. So the first Buddha image was thus much more than a replica. It was a double that could not, indeed should not be differentiated from its model. The image was alive, perhaps more alive than the Buddha himself. It would not only take his place, it would outlive him. Now, according to the Japanese version of the story, the living image was then carried off to China, actually carried off by a porter who carried the icon on his back during the day, while the icon carried the porter on his back at night, thereby making the journey in half the time. And in China, it was later copied by a Japanese pilgrim to bring back to Kyoto. But the night before his return to Japan, the living image switched places with its own copy so that the Japanese icon is none other than the living image magically produced when the Buddha was visiting his mother in heaven. Now, what this score story obscures, of course, is the complex series of social and historical practices which provided the image with its conditions of possibility. The historian of religion has only the textual narrative. The historian of art has only the physical form. For both, the living image is already a fait accompli. It's a product without a process. And it is this process to which Laurel's book attends. Now, my second question uh, has to do with another important aspect of the book. That is the way that the book attends not only to how images are alive and enlivened, but also the fate and function of their afterlives, their museumification the condition in which so many of those outside of their cultures of production and use encounter them. So as you yourself are a curator of Asian ethnographic collections at the American Museum of Natural History, my second question is then, what does the book suggest or propose for museum practice? So those are my my two questions and thoughts, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to read through this book so carefully and to be in conversation with you all here today. Hey, Laurel, do you want to take these questions now? Uh, oh, sure. Let, let me take these now, because I think we're going to go in a, in a little bit different direction. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Max, for your comments. Thanks for getting the Seiryoji story in there. I, was, I really appreciate that. Um, okay, if I understand your first question, it's, it's sort of the um, what, what do you, you know, where are we with, there's religious studies, there's art history, what does an anthropologist add or do? Um, I mean, if, 
one of the big questions is why did it take so long? And I think there are very good reasons for that. Um, in the first, you know, the first reaction of the Christian West, particularly the Protestant Christian West, to iconography in the East was horror and revulsion. This is the golden calf. These are heathen idols. And then there was an era of appreciation and apologia where um, scholars of religion would study philosophy and say, this is philosophy that's up there with the big time philosophy. And that's how it's approached, uh, was traditionally approached in departments of East Asian studies, for example. Um, and for the art side, okay, uh, we can have the statues, but we make them objects of art. And there is serious writing by serious modern Asian intellectuals about, um, you know, this is, this is really all symbolic and it's just the simple common people who misunderstand this in superstitious ways. And part of what I was trying to do in the book is blast through this. No, statues mean a great deal to a great many people. Many people live with statues. statues are alive and present and agentive in their lives. And we need to appreciate this. I think we are to a point where we can comfortably do that. We've learned to appreciate them as art. We've learned to appreciate the philosophy. Those battles are all won. Now let's look at how this stuff is really lived. And that, and we are seeing, as I noted, you know, this growing literature of specific case material but I think that there needs to, that a cross conversation is, you know, more than overdue and what one of the things I hope the book would do. Um, the, uh, this leads to the second issue, the fate and function of afterlife. How do I position myself as a curator? Um, well, of course, the question of sacred things inside museums has been a subject of discussion for, oh, at least as long as I've been a curator, um, initially provoked by the concerns of indigenous people who see their sacred material as having been ripped off and desecrated. And we see a lot of fruitful dialogue within museums about how to handle this. And a growing awareness in museum culture of the sacredness of things that should be respected. And you see museum conservator, when anthropologists talk about the bisensate experience of anthropology or your, anthropo your Western social science self doesn't necessarily have to believe in the spirits. You just have to write about what they are and their consequences, but your field working self might fall into it, might dream in it, might operate, make offerings and pray and in ways that are part of that world. But we begin to see this in museum conservation labs where my colleagues working on the new Northwest Coast Hall were hanging um, devil's club over things and they were covering powerful objects. And you see in museum storerooms signs saying shamanic uh, objects in this um, uh, corridor so that, well, initially so that native visitors um, don't encounter powers that they feel they don't want to encounter when they're there, but beginning to take it on as a, as a respectful part of their own practice. All right, so, so in this culture, pregnant women aren't or menstruating women aren't supposed to work on this stuff. We'll honor that. Um, these, these small changes. Now, as a curator, collecting things and exhibiting things. I will say I'm very glad I don't work in an art museum. I do work in a natural history museum because first of all, all kinds of things that I consider to have wonderful stories would never make it in an art museum, but they're very meaningful to people. And it's my task to bring those stories to life. Secondly, because it's a natural history museum, and we have long traditions of contextualization. We can do things that suggest how things exist on altars and offering. When we did Vietnam journeys and our Vietnamese colleagues helped us 
do an assemblage for a New Year altar, for example, that had cookie boxes on it and uh, you know, bottles of whiskey and all, all the things that really should be there that gave it life that you so often don't see even in Vietnam on exhibits of ancestral altars. They're there because they're, they're beautiful carved wood. Um, I don't know if that's where you want, you were, what you were looking for in terms of direction. Um, happy to talk more at great length about this on another occasion. Okay, great. All right, so uh, let's now uh, turn to uh, Professor uh, Sharp, okay? Hey, everybody. Um, I, Laurel, thank you. I, I love those last comments, especially about the ethics, but we might think of it as the ethics of care, of objects and people and audiences. So um, I'd like to, I just want to, before I launch into my comments and questions for Laurel, I just want to say thank you for this invitation. I am not an Asianist. And so um, it's a special pleasure to be able to engage in this discussion. Um, I'm actually originally trained as an Africanist. So I, I've learned a lot in, in reading the book and in listening to the comments today. And I also just want to say, Myron and Max, it's such a pleasure to join you with this. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to read and comment, and then I'm going to end with a, a question for Laurel. I've really enjoyed reading this book, um, and not just for the book itself, but for the opportunity to journey back to the worlds of mediums and spirits, because as an anthropologist, that's where my journey began. Um, my first field work was on mediumship and spirit possession in Madagascar. And in fact, I owe a tremendous debt to Laurel because she was a significant inspiration for me when I was a graduate student. And it's so wonderful to have been on this long journey with Laurel and who has stayed loyal, even though I don't work with um, spirit mediums anymore. So among my favorite arguments in the book involves the process of what we might call enlivening um, the enlivening, the enlivening, me, enlivening, and I'm deliberately using an ing on the end of this word because it's a process that never has an end, it seems to me. So the enlivening of ordinary things that transform into the extraordinary. There's a host of words that accompany this term that Laurel uses. They include animation, ensoulment, energy, the energizing of objects, and as I say this, I even balk, I'm not sure what word to use. Is it the enlivenment of an object or a thing? Or should we be inserting another word? And so I'm, I'm, I'm grappling with the, the vocabulary <coughs> itself. And that's something that Laurel has taught me to do um, throughout my read of this book. So for the sake of my comments, I'm going to employ enlivening as a shorthand or a catch-all term of sorts. Um, as, as everyone who's listening today now realizes, if you didn't know already, Laurel is a fabulous storyteller. And then we've got Max who's doing the same thing. And so I feel a bit ashamed because I don't have a story to tell. But, but, um, but it does make me think of stories that I've lived through. So a special note for me is Laurel's meticulous attention to the conditions that can enable enlivenment not only the work and the expertise that goes into the crafting of objects, something that has been attended to for a very long time, um, decades ago by Africanists who, are very in, who worked with carvers, for instance. Um, and so here we're encountering it in a new form, I think, that's really exciting. So it's not just the crafting, though, of objects, but also their use. And in ways that in each of these contexts, whether it's the crafting or the, or the use, perhaps these are inseparable domains that facilitate possibilities of enlightenment. Um, and that this is also a really important intervention on her part to be thinking not just about what happens in the temple context, for instance, or in the, you know, in a, even in a private home or a personal shrine or during a ritual event, but also the significance of the maker of the object and the material aspects of that object, what kind of wood it would be, and that kind of thing, that all of these things are full of life themselves, and that one needs to derive enlivenment, so to speak, from other kinds of living things and objects and people, and that sort of thing, if that makes sense. Um, so 
the other part of this is that is the agentive quality of these objects that they they aren't sitting around waiting for a human being or a group of human beings to energize them but in fact some of them like we think about Gero america that they can enliven themselves which is just an absolutely brilliant observation i think and this is what really kept me awake at night when i would have to put down the book and go to bed is this idea that that objects are enlivening themselves but it's not a form of commodity fetishism. It's that they're alive in their own. They 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 awaken themselves in this in a sense in some of these instances, and I found that really compelling. So, if we stick to domains of religious experience, what these examples tell us is that objects can move in and out of the sacred on their own volition, and unlike, for instance, a weeping Madonna in a Catholic context. These aren't miracles, but instead they're really in the realm of the ordinary and of the everyday. And that's where we need the anthropologist, I think, more than, more than anyone else. That's what, that's what anthropologists do, is we pay attention to the everyday and the mundane and look what it is that Laurel discovers for us. A quality that was especially enjoyable for me too was the theme of the unexpected that runs throughout the, bo the book and dominates every chapter. Laurel's adroit descriptions of her own surprising experiences, even on the very first page with this concept of the MacGuffin, delights the reader, who in turn experiences their own surprise. This bundle of arguments about enlivenment and ensoulment, about the agentive quality of objects unto themselves, and on the surprises that we encounter along the way, this bundle of arguments is marvelous, and I couldn't stop thinking about them. Laurel's careful comparative work too, something which comes naturally to us as anthropologists, but clearly isn't necessarily something that goes on in other, any other domains of knowledge, um, spans years of engagement only, and this only further enriches these arguments that she's positing for us. And it's done like a true anthropologist. So hooray, hooray. Um, Laurel flagged me as a participant, I think. She said this in, in our former meetings together. She's flagged me, flagged me as a participant today in part because I've worked on organ donation and organ transplantation in, in the US. And I think she hopes that I'm going to draw from this as a way to reflect on mediums and magical things. And then Max himself has told this story of the Buddha and the, the, the Buddha being paired with the statue that embodies these organs that then embody the Buddha himself, or do we say himself with Buddha itself himself? And so I started to think, well, how, how might the re ensoulment of a damaged body affect notions of personhood for an organ transplant recipient? So basically what I'm saying here is that reading this material has made me re rethink and revisit some of my own former research. In my own work though, I actually moved in what might be thought of as a retrograde um, motion. In other words, my earliest work with spirit mediums in Madagascar actually taught me how to think about transplants and what kinds of questions to ask. And so in a way I'm revisiting that now too, thanks to Laurel's work, rethinking transplants because of the work that she's offered us here today. So, for instance, just to give you all a taste of this, the conversations that I had with transplant recipients were uncannily similar to the ways that mediums spoke of spirits who inhabited them back in Madagascar. So when I think about mediums and magical things, I realized that in both instances, I myself was confronting unexpected forms of enlivenment, ensoulment, and animation, and perhaps my point here is that these are part of the human condition. We're in both, both spirits of the dead in Madagascar and organs implanted by surgeons in the United States entail the engagement of agentive entities, persons, and things. So Laurel, thank you for helping me to rethink all of that. I'd like to, uh, I think it always helps to give authors something to answer. And so I do have, um, I have a couple of questions for Laurel. Um, and so here goes. There are two themes that really stood out for me in reading the book um, that I'd love Laurel to address. And these are danger 
and failure. These are themes that have emerged in her other work. If you've read her other works, if you've heard her speak about her other projects, um, and I think of her as an expert on these things, on danger and failure, and also on their entwinement. And so I'd love to hear a bit more about how she's come to think about failure and danger as analytical categories in the course of this most recent project. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. Thanks again to Laurel for the opportunity to read and ponder this wonderful book. Thank you. So Laurel wanted to uh, okay. uh, take on these questions. And, and afterwards, we're going to uh, uh, open up for uh, uh, questions from the, uh, from the audience. And, and, and Laurel, just before you, uh, before you start, I'd just like to uh, re remind everyone who is uh, listening and watching this that uh, should you uh, uh, have questions, you should use the Q and A. Uh, uh, you should use the you use use the the, the Q and A function to uh, get your questions to the panel. Okay, now Laurel, please. Okay, first of all, well, thank you, Leslie, and thank you. There was so much in your comments. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a proverb in Korean: the interpretation is better than the dream itself. <laughs> and I kind of felt that as I was listening to both of you. I, I'm very appreciative. I also want to thank you for calling out, recognizing the difficulty I had in finding a verb: enlivenment, insolment, animation. Um, it there there are a couple of issues here. We started using the word consecration was the word that was the common translation view, but that is just too vanilla. I mean, Catholic stuff gets consecrated, all kinds of things get consecrated. Sometimes there are secular acts like, you know, putting up a statue in a public place that could be considered consecrative, you know, a little too broad. So we needed things that had more punch, but at the same time, I was very suspicious of an overuse of the new animism. You know, like suddenly we can talk about animism again. And so people see it in all kinds of places and people want to see it in Korean shaman practice. And I want to be very precise that this is not the sense that spirits are innate in things, but that things contain, hold, offer seats for forces that come from the out there. And, and um, the stakes are in making and maintaining a proper place for this power to be. And I guess questions of danger and failure come from that. Um, danger, I, I think Hilly Geertz said it most explicitly, but a lot of people I talk to and talking about, well, what is it? used electricity as an analogy. And I go into this in the book that it's both a scholar's metaphor, but it's also a metaphor in the field because everyone I talked to had experience of electricity. And electricity is this wonderful, bright, blazing, useful, helpful thing. But if you touch it in the wrong way at the wrong time, it can kill you. And that's the kind of power that we're talking about. You know, how to contain, how to direct that power in ways that works for us, you know, ask the deity for goodwill um, and give back your gratitude, enter into a relationship with it. So danger then implies a lot of things. It implies both acts, you know, acts, acts of iconoclasm are, the, are obviously dangerous and there are all kinds of stories around Korea, I suspect China as well, about people did bad things to statues in anti-superstition campaigns, and then, wow, they got theirs afterward. Horrible things happened to them. Um, but uh, also the danger of well-intentioned but inappropriate use. The shaman who takes in paintings and does the ritual correctly but the gods in the new paintings and the gods in the old paintings really don't want to be together. So they make trouble and they let her know. And it's dangerous. There are consequences. Um, she nips it in the bud so it doesn't get any worse. Um, failure, how is failure interconnected? Leslie, I think you probably have some ideas of your own. What immediately comes to my mind is I mean, failure is, is a broad spectrum. There's, there's the failure that gives you the dud 
And the danger is just losing your investment. The Balinese community invests in making a mask and they take, you know, they do all the rituals properly and they put a, you know, a lot of effort and expense into it. And then it's there in the graveyard in deep midnight and it just doesn't extrude light. It's a dud and it's got to be cast out. You know, it just doesn't work. It's the failed, the absolutely failed battery. It's the car that's never going to start. Um, but there's the failure that I think there's also a sense of that comes from, oh, golly, there's a wonderful word in uh, Tom Bias that is eluding me at the moment, but the failure where you do things and you don't do them right, you don't do them properly, you make some mistake and there are bad, bad consequences. And there is a sense of bad object, bad statue, the, sta you know, the, the statue that, that doesn't, well, I don't really mention it in the book, but as part of this six objects project, my colleagues, Win Van Hui and Fan Lan Hoon, um, they went to a village where there was a statue installed in the communal house. And there were two factions in the village and the new faction said, this is a good thing to do. And the old faction said, no, you do, you put a tablet in the communal house. You do not put a statue. You're making it into a temple. You're causing all sorts of things. Uh, uh, this is wrong. And there are always consequences when you do wrong things in a ritual context. And there was a huge a removal of the statue an official removal of the animating packet. There had been rumors that the animation itself was inappropriate, that somebody had snuck their ancestors' ashes in. And they, so it was documented and photographed that it was all OK. Um, the faction that had been pro-statue called out a curse on the other faction, but it was the faction that inappropriately installed the statue that had a series of deaths in the family that the village said, ha, it's their fault. They did it wrong. Um, Consequences can always be read backward as um, ritual malfeasance, that it, it, things done wrong. Those are the risks, those are the stakes. And why people say, you know, when you're a foreigner, an anthropologist, and you get interested in ritual, you know, be very careful what you do, because when you go back to America, you can't keep this up and you may get in trouble. You know, protective that that you know if you're dealing with electricity be sure you've got rubber soles on your feet and you've turned off the fuse box and whatever i is that what you the kind of stuff you had in mind yes <laughs> thank you so would you like would you like me to to help you the the q a now okay so Wait, we I, I just like to say a couple oh. of remarks Oh, uh, sorry, Myron. Sorry. It's all right. No, I'm going to turn it over to you in just a couple. Of, I just want uh, just to, uh, wanted to uh, add a few uh, experiences from my own field work uh, uh, to uh, this discussion because Laurel's whole uh, uh, encounter dealing with uh, uh, enlivenment uh, uh, puts new questions into my mind as well. Uh, and so I'll just give a few examples. Uh, as I, I'm thinking, really, in the in the context of the of the of the anti superstition campaigns in uh, in uh, in China and uh, uh, the subsequent uh, revival of uh, of popular religion there, uh, uh, certain similarities to the to the North Vietnamese case, but I, I think that the parallels are not are not complete. That they were different situations. However, uh, as early as 1975, during my first trip to China, uh, we and this is during the Cultural Revolution, mind you. Uh, uh, we, we were taken, we were in southern China, the group I was with, and I saw a bridge. And at one end of the bridge was a pile of rubble. And I looked at the pile of rubble and there were incense sticks surrounding that pile of rubble. That pile of rubble obviously had been an earth god shrine. And what I found interesting was that they were still worshiping even though it had physically been destroyed, which brings into, the whole, in, into uh, uh, my mind the whole question of where was the god? Uh, in the in the minds of the uh, worshippers, was it still in the rubble, or were they worshiping the the rubble as an as as an act to somehow inform the god, uh, please keep on protecting the bridge? This is this, this, these are questions, or maybe even both. These are these are questions uh, 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 that arise. And um, 
Later in 1985, in my first field trip to China, that was in North China in Hebei province. And uh, the, in 1985, uh, it was still before the, the revival of popular religion on any, on, on any uh, uh, observable scale, uh, 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 there was a funeral. And one, and one uh, element of the funeral was the uh, escorting of the soul of the deceased from the community. You know, this is something that James Watson spoke about a long time ago, the, the, the soul is expelled from the community. And where do they take the soul of the deceased in a large procession? To the local earth god shrine where it is put into custody until such time as the as the uh, overlord of the dead called the city god rather inappropriately but as the overlord of the dead uh, will take that soul and escort it to the underworld well so the soul has been brought to a, an earth god shrine there is no earth god shrine they build one out of bricks a temporary earth god shrine and they go through the entire ceremony and then they dismantle it Many other objects of religion are built and dismantled during the course of this uh, 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 funeral. Finally, my final example comes from 1990 in, 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 in my fieldwork near Shanghai City. It was in what was then called Shanghai County, which is separate. But in, uh, I, was in a, I was living with a family and this family seemed to be totally uninterested in these matters that we've been discussing, totally, totally secularized, I suppose you'd call it until the Lunar New Year. Uh, and then to my astonishment, I walked into the main dining room and, the and several tables had been combined to one very large table. And at the edge of the table were, were sacrificial bowls aligned on all four sides. Again, a, 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 a physical act, uh, uh, but in the absence of any kind of permanent or even long enduring uh, uh, re 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 uh, re material religious object. So, and, and, and I was discussing this with people, and this is how, uh, as it were, popular religion uh, 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 survived through the whole period of the Cultural Revolution uh, and, uh, and the subsequent era until, uh, until uh, the, the liberalization uh, took, took hold in uh, China. So again, the, the whole relationship between the physical and the, and the imagined or the thought uh, and, the, the, and the whole issue of enlivenment uh, uh, really, uh, really comes to uh, uh, comes to my mind in uh, in confronting this kind of a, a situation. So that was just I just wanted to add it to add to that because I think it it uh, it uh, it ties into some of the things that you have been discussing in your uh, book. Do you would you like to respond to that, or should we move to the questioning now? I'd love to respond to that. Um, I think that um, what's being talked about here is well. First of all, what is a statue? A statue is intended to be a concentration of presence. Right. And you know, more powerful, stronger. When Leslie was talking about you used in live and you use different words, I was thinking also there are different acts in different degrees. Um, in the North Vietnamese world, there's the statue, and we've been talking about that in great detail and the elaborate protocols to have the god in the statue, but there are paintings or, or woodblock images that people use if they couldn't afford a statue and you call a ritual master in and they do something. And that something makes it not neutral matter, but it doesn't have the power of a statue. And I think, you know, your sense of, yes, here's the place. So the God knows this stuff is going on and the God's there, but wouldn't it be so much better to have a statue because the God would be there and, you know, able to work for the devotees in a much stronger, much more concentrated way. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do mention that case where the, in a village where I went to the shrine and they just had little cheap wood blocks on the wall and they explained they'd taken things down and people got arthritis and it was really horrible. And then the next time I went back, they had these big beautiful statues and they were so proud because this was, this was a mu much more present presence. And you know, I wish, I, I mean, there were some conversations with ritual masters about how they might see the difference in the different ways things are enlightened, talismans get enlightened. You know, you put something on the wall for, to protect the family and there's, there's a prayer that goes with it. But it's again, not the same thing as a statue, but it's not, a, not just a piece of paper on the wall. 
okay. Uh, uh, so now I think we're going to go to the uh, to the uh, Q and A phase of of our uh, of our program today, and uh, Professor Sharp will be uh, will be in charge of that. So, is there so, any so we have we have one question so far, and I'd like to invite others to please join in the conversation. Just type it into the Q and A tab. Um, Laurel, there's a question from Eric White. Could you share? Could you share a few of the most compelling and or surprising similarities and in, in caps and differences across the four case studies? That's a small question. So, <laughs> okay. So can you could you share a few of the most compelling and or surprising similarities and differences across the four case studies? All right. Um, I, for me, the big surprise, I felt so really dumb that I had lived you know, a long time in and out of East Asia. I had bowed to I don't know how many statues and I had not really realized, you know, coming from a Western Catholic plaster saints background that these images were meant to contain Buddhas and gods, that there was a way of making them more present than just literally representational. And that this presence was consequential, that you know, in Vietnam, people were talking about the bad things that happened when the statues came down. Um, I talk about three, three affordances in the book. Um, you know, there is the big affordance of the, the European world and the Asian world, the broad Eurasian, and that is long traditions of statue making in the human form, that things are done in workshops, that they're specially commissioned. That means that you, the, um, the ritual specialist, are not the same person as you, the person who, car who has the skill to produce the image. And that raises all kinds of questions of trust. Is the wood good? Is the, are all of the taboos observed really and honestly? In Taiwan, somebody who had been apprenticed in a statue carving workshop told me, you know, Taiwan used to have wonderful sandalwood and it was very expensive and very precious. And people would bring their own to the carving workshop, but they would put their own chop on the bottom of the block of wood to be sure that they were getting their own wood back because you needed that good wood to get that very, very good statue. So um, traditions of workshop artisanship and everything that all the, the notions of trust and reputation that go with it. Then you get the big divide where in, in um, Catholic traditions of statue, and we can't just speak of Europe, I, I give some examples in, in the book, I, I reference Catholic statue practice, and we're, you know, we have to talk about Catholics in Vietnam and Catholics in the Philippines, as well as, as Catholics um, in the Euro-American world. But where the statue Yes, there are instances of miraculous statues, but really statues in human form have a long and troubled history. You know, to early Christians, this, these are remnants of the antique world. These are remnants of idolatry and they should be shunned. And statues come in human, uh, the painted image, the two-dimensional image is there much but long before the statue. The statue, there, there are a lot of scholarship on this, including Carolyn Bynum, the brilliant religious historian at Columbia, of um, how when materiality comes back in, when people start producing the human form, there's always a lot of theological squeamishness. This is not the God, this is the representation. Mm -hmm. um, and when miraculous things happen, they are miraculous because they're not supposed to happen and they have to, there's theological squeamishness and great investigation. Whereas a whole swath of Hindu Buddhist world where, yeah, gods are in statues and they're powerful and this, this we accept, that's affordance number two. And then for my case material, and this is what I think Max was alluding to in some of his remarks, 
I chose cases where it wasn't just the big image in the Buddhist temple, it was images used by spirit mediums and shamans. Mm -hmm. Images where the power and the deity presence in the image worked with the practitioner who had the temp who gave it the temp the mobility of the body, but that was a temporary mobility uh, for image for presences that were otherwise present in immobile forms. The mask, even, which is the most mobile form of all, because it's the mask that goes around, the mask needs the body to move. So, so we have another we have another question, um, and this is for Laurel and for Max. It, it looks like Max is typing an answer. It's from Ming Shu. Forgive me for mispronouncing your name. I'd like to thank Laurel for guiding me to John uh, Kishnik's book, The yeah. Impact of Buddhism on Chinese Material Culture. He, as well as some parts of Laurel's book, points out the striking paradox in Buddhism that it denies or renounces materiality on the one hand, while devotees value or venerate Buddha's images and statues and texts on the other hand. I'd like Laurel and Max to comment on this if possible. Oops, and now the question just disappeared. So I guess Max must have answered it. I can't reread the question because it just disappeared. Oh, here we okay. go. Am I Should speaking I now? Yeah, you go first. Want me to reread uh -huh. the question? Are you okay? No, no. Um, this is great because right after right after this, I have to go to my class where we're discussing John Kishnick's book. Um, Kishnick, thank you. Kishnick, Kishnick, yeah. Kishnick. John Kishnick at Stanford University uh, wrote a wonderful book called uh, uh, "The Impact of Buddhism on Chinese Material Culture," um, which unfortunately I I found after I was in press, so it isn't in the bibliography. Ah. Uh, in any case, um, the question has to do with um, with the relationship between Buddhist theories of materiality. That is that um, that we should recognize the immateriality of all materials, and that they are empty of any permanent or autonomous identity, just as people are empty of a permanent or autonomous self hmm. and the practice the buddhist practice of venerating images um there has rarely been any um any buddhist critique of the veneration of images indeed um the uh an early uh one of the earliest uh Buddhist texts, the scripture on the production of Buddha images. It was one of the earliest uh, Indian Buddhist texts translated into Chinese. The Buddha is asked, uh, what sort of good fortune will I obtain by producing an image of the Buddha to benefit and bequeath to later generations? And the Buddha replies, a person who produces an image of the Buddha will, in a later life, have clear eyes and a handsome appearance. His body, hands, and feet will always be excellent. He will not be born a child to a poor or destitute family, but to a wealthy family with money and precious jewels beyond reckoning. He will always be loved by his parents, siblings, and relatives. He will be born either to the family of an emperor or a prince, or born a child to a family of great virtue, uh, and he will uh, his life's his life will span a single aeon, and his wisdom will be without equal. Afterward, he will certainly attain the path of Buddhist nirvana. Um, so the Buddhist tradition, the Buddhist textual tradition, is adamantly uh, clear in its. Uh, in its promotion and value of Buddhist images to venerate. Um, um, only at certain times, I think, in the Chan tradition, is there sort of a rhetoric against, um, against the, uh, 
the materiality of images. But then again, that isn't against images per se, but it's a larger question um, about claims to non-duality. Uh, so I think it is, um, it may very much be sort of uh, the Euro-American reading of Buddhist traditions uh, that assumes an antagonism uh, towards not just images, but towards matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Buddhists don't deny matter. <laughs> they just suggest a way of understanding it. If I can add to this, um, thank you. I mean, that's the, the, the wonderful scholarly biologist reassuring response to this. Um, and I think I, I want to start where you went, you ended it, this North American and the, the people, the, the people who got really excited about Buddhism in the late 19th century, they're coming from a very Protestant Northeast seaboard tradition, and that's what they lift up. About 15 years ago, when the journal Material Religion came into being, and the whole subfield of material religion, there was a lot of talk about can you do religion without material? And if you think of the most body denying, ascetic re, um, religious practice imaginable, you still can't take that apart from the body. It's, you're trying to just transcend the body, but how do you know you're doing it? You need a body in the first instance. There is no religion without materiality. I also just want to mention that the questioner, I think this is Ming Shui, who is my colleague, who together we we did a little exhibit on Tibetan tanka painting. She is doing wonderful research on women tanka painters and what this all means, what it means for them to produce this sacred art. So watch for it. There, are there any more questions? Do we have any? Right now, no. If okay. anyone wants uh, I'd like to just jump in at the moment uh, because as 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 uh, as uh, as I've been listening to uh, our conversation, uh, a thought popped into my head about the whole issue of enlivenment. That that there was a big controversy over enlivenment at the end of the Ming Dynasty. That was known as the rights controversy. Whereas mm -hmm. where, whereas the uh, 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 one side of one side of the of the of the uh, of the Catholic missionaries uh, in China. Uh, said that ancestor worship was not worship, right? It was it was just uh, it was a, it was a, a civic action. It was it was honoring the ancestors. Whereas the others claimed precisely that these ancestral tablets were enlivened, that the ancestors were in them, and that so if you worship them, you can't be a Christian. Uh, uh, and so it's interesting that 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 there was a kind of a uh, uh, an earlier version of 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 this of this concept honed out through this controversy. Okay, any, well, we, we have uh, just a few more minutes if anybody wants to make a uh, final remark or? Well, just to uh, respond to uh, Myron and uh, Laurel's examples, um, so much of the concern over uh, images and animate images, uh, certainly within not only the Western Academy, but within Western popular culture, does very much come from a whole history of Catholic and Protestant, uh, you know, theories uh, of the image. And I think that it behooves us to, uh, to examine our own intellectual tradition uh, mm -hmm. as perhaps maybe the source of what are presented as problems uh, in other traditions, that's all. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more, uh, you know, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's one of the claims of anthropology. We go out, we look around and we come back and maybe we understand ourselves with a more critical and constructive perspective. Um, before we sign off, I just wanted to call attention to the discount code for the book, <laughs> if anybody is interested. Okay, good. Now, let me, well, 
And I just want to, uh, uh, since I'm the, I've been the moderator, I just want to, uh, again, thank everybody uh, on the panel. It's been a very, for me, it's been a very, uh, and for everybody else, it's been a very, very stimulating and productive uh, conversation. And I just join uh, uh, Laurel in uh, urging uh, those who are watching to take advantage of this 30% uh, discount that you can get with, uh, with that particular uh, a link there on the screen. It's a great book. <laughs> yes, it's a great book indeed. Okay. Congratulations, Laurel. Yes. Okay. Congratulations. All right. So I guess we can uh, we can conclude at this uh, moment. And uh, again, uh, thanks everybody who uh, who uh, who was watching. Uh, and uh, thanks. And once again. Thanks to the panel, and we will uh, conclude now. Okay, that's it. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. It's been such a pleasure. Bye bye. Look forward to seeing you in the real world. Right. Yes, to all of you. <laughs>